In, mm -hmm. in your agenda, you'll see that we're now on the topic of role of culture and societal transformation. I'm Angie. I'm just going to let you all introduce yourselves um, really quick, just your name and your entity or the enterprise. Hi, I'm Marina Cushing. I'm the executive director of the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative. Good morning. Uh, my name is Lauren Harris. I'm chief program officer at the Kenneth Brainerd Foundation. Good morning. I am Jessica Norwood, the founder of the Runway Project. Great. So I would like to actually start by actually asking Jessica and Noni to just tell us really briefly like what each of your projects are. What is EBPREC? What is Runway Project? Just a, an overview that kind of lays the groundwork for this conversation. So I think in a very um, practical way, Runway Project um, provides um, capital, particularly early kinds of money, to African-American entrepreneurs. And the type of money that we are giving these businesses is what we call friends and family money. And specifically, it's that early round of money that when people say, you've got a really great idea, you should borrow money from your friends and your family. But then when you look at the um, disparities inside of wealth, you realize very quickly that your friends and your family do not have that kind of money. And so what ends up happening is that the kinds of businesses that get put out into the world really start to look like one group of people, very much, and it doesn't really represent the full swath of who we all are. So we step in and provide that kind of capital. We work with um, the entire ecosystem around businesses, so we're working with technical support providers, um, business consultants, and bank depository institutions, CDFIs, the whole gambit to really get them putting money out in ways that are appropriate and friendly and responsive to those borrowers. So that's the sort of short version, but we really are thinking very deeply about <coughs> the practices that we have with the way that we steward our money, how we pass that along, and what we think about who we should take a risk on, who's, who's worthy of those opportunities. All of that stuff is embedded in that. And these are cultural responses that we're challenging. So more broadly, this is also about culture. And then very, very um, sweetly, it's about culture, because I'm also wearing the earrings mm -hmm. of Candid Art, which is one of the companies that we have supported. So it's very directly supporting the artists but it's in, cu in culture in that way, and the makers, and then very broadly challenging these ideas and norms and patterns that we have um, that underpin how we move our capital. And I just want to put. Um, I'll do this a lot because I feel like I, I, we have a particular perspective that I actually want to make super transparent, which is when we first sat down together, there was a part of me that just thought, huh, well, maybe, maybe the, the big picture of how we support um, artists in, in the, for instance, here in Oakland, um, African-American artists, business owners, um, et cetera, is maybe they just need more, um, there are, needs to be more intermediaries that support black uh, business owners. But, talking to you made me realize like it's really important about who owns the ability to make those financial investment decisions that it's not just transactional it's really important that being of the community in that community that cultural tie is what is actually going to create that sense of self-determination and the thing that really kind of brought it home for me is that the if i am remembered correctly um, that the capital that you raise through these conventional cd products are also capital raised from the community, right? So that they themselves have this connection then to the very business owners who they should be shopping with, right? Yeah. It's circuitous. It's another way that made me think about how money can be regenerative, right? Yeah. Yeah. That piece was for me an aha moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Noni, would you go? Yes. Um, So many elements that I'm trying to figure out how to. Can I can I lead it. into one yeah, and then you yeah. can talk about the work also. Yeah. Um, so originally when we approached Noni and the team, um, because I know you guys all work very cooperatively. You are a co-op, but you work very much in collaboration <laughs> with each other. Um, so much time. And I, we have to still unpack what we're talking about when we say East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative, which I hope you will do. But at first we were like. So we have a whole funding category around um, supporting 
um, ownership of assets by artists. And at first we approached it because we were like, ooh, maybe this will be a good way to get into a little bit of the real estate issue because, hello, we're in East Bay, California. Real estate is super expensive. And honestly, until we met you, we were like, well, there's no way that ownership of assets that will touch the real estate um, as an asset because it is, it's a, a far more expensive game than what we can play with our smaller dollars. But it was actually, your, you mentioned it as you won't maybe remember, but you said, I'm a cultural anthropologist by training. And then suddenly I was like, wait, let's talk about it this way. And then it was like, oh, this is about empowerment, about kind of taking not even just control um, by a cultural community of real estate assets. It became more about like a process of how people can start to work together and reclaim a way of working together that over and over people have divided and, you know, I mean, people literally saying you can't be in this community, either through um, prison systems or gentrification, et cetera. Does that maybe give you a pathway to kind of, okay. Yeah, I, we originally um, uh, launched our vision on the basis of helping um, people of color, black, indigenous, people of color, and allied communities um, find, um, finance, acquire, and long-term asset manage um, land and housing in Oakland and the East Bay. Um, we're doing this through this model, so we are the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative, but we're piloting a model called the Permanent Real Estate Cooperative. And it combines some of the, the most impactful elements of different um, social, socially driven organizations we find in our communities. However, um, as separate entities, um, these different elements that I'll name shortly have not really um, had the um, impact of stabilizing um, the most underrepresented communities. You could call them frontline communities. I'm talking about black people, right? And I'm talking about the, the communities that experience the same kinds of um, anti-black, anti-indigenous, anti-people uh, of color, or the other term you could think of it is racialized displacement. And there are lots of dynamics that um, flow into this phenomena um, that we think of as racialized displacement. And so um, we combine several elements, um, primarily um, beginning founding in the community investment part of our model, where you can think of what EBPREC does as a housing and solidarity fund um, but it does so much more than that. So we um, bring in $1,000 investments from community members, non-accredited investors, folks with a net worth of, million, of a million dollars or less um, for a 1.5% return over five years. Um, however, that's not the, the end of the story because you gotta understand that assets in Oakland and the Bay Area are a million dollars or above, period. Um, so the the we gather together 100 to 200 investors around a particular project, and we use that community buy-in to um, move our projects through our mission-aligned lenders and investors' um, sphere of influence, right? So we um, take these projects that are, that are put together in relationship to community members who bring us projects. So our first flagship project um, about nine folks found their apartment building was going up for sale. So we created bios, um, we came up with the vision for how they are already impacting the community, how they would like to continue to create that ripple effect through stabilized housing. Um, we supported them with a com community investment campaign. So that's all the communications, um, that's all the outreach, that's all the financial management of the capital that we bring in. Um, we exposed that project to program-related investment, mission-to-line investment. Um, we found that we even are able to expose the project to some government funds if we have the right partners. So we also bring together the other folks on this landscape of trying to stabilize and act in trust um, and in advocacy for the community. So our first project is in partnership with Northern California Land Trust. Our second is in partnership with Oakland Community Land Trust. Our third project is in partnership with a concerned community member who didn't want to see another um, million dollar townhouse built in the middle of West Oakland, right? Our third project will be 
in partnership with about five different organizations. So we combine the community investment model, the movement building and organizing model, um, the cooperative housing model, the worker co-op model, and the land trust model to support folks who normally wouldn't have the time, the skill set, the networks, the resources in coming from vision to long-term asset management. And it's a recognition that the whole chain from beginning to end has been broken in mm -hmm. underrepresented communities, right? And wealth building for communities has to extend past the attainment of the asset itself. I was talking about this the other day where we misrecognize the power of assets, the power of commodity goods. And what actually has to happen outside of that, because if you look historically, you, can, you know that, that, it, that at the moment that um, emancipation happened, there were black folks who knew that you needed to attain land and housing and assets. But there are lots of other network, capital, political, personal, communal mechanisms that dismantle that generation after generation after generation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we're looking to extend past the moment of attaining the asset and recognize that there are durable networks that have to be built. There are skill sets that have to be reinvested into the community. There are long-term, um, more complex financial management skills. There is, is land trust work that has to work so that it, the, it resists, if you will, mission drift, um, even among ourselves as we're relearning how to build together, what to build together, and how to face this um, transformation of our economy. Right. So we're looking at from beginning to end to create something durable that every generation you don't have to um, reignite a whole community to do so. And what I'm reminded of is that <clears throat> I, <clears throat> excuse me, I alluded to this earlier, which is, in some ways, I don't know if it's because we're still super naive and are new to this work, but it feels like a lot of, this, of the work that you guys are describing, both in your own community, but we're seeing, of course, because there are others of you in this room, pockets of this kind of effort in other communities. North Minneapolis is an example, um, also um, certainly in, in Boston, is that it's, it's so complex because what you're describing is it's not enough to do this work, and I want to start to unpack what this work is, right, through this cultural lens. It's not enough to just say, I'm going to just do a community land trust. You're talking about building an entire infrastructure and a, a, and a way of behavior, mm -hmm. right, rooted in a sense of people who are in it together. Mm -hmm. That is just deep layers, right? I mean, even just the sense of, like, how do you get people to say, oh, I'm in the community, I, my, my decision, my vote on how to deploy capital, for instance, that matters. <clears throat> that's not something that's ingrained into so many communities that have been um, disinvested from. So I also want to just also credit that you guys came out of an incubation effort, um, if I remember cor correctly, um, by Sustainable Economies Law Center. Mm -hmm. And I just point that piece out to say it would be unfair to rely, including us, on just these leaders to be like, do everything. We actually have to start, I mean, we, I'm just talking personally, we have been having to really also look at what creates a soft landing, what what uh, tills the soil. Mm -hmm. There's a whole mm -hmm. nature of ecosystem sort of yes. stuff funding that is necessary, and I will say falls out of so many foundation guidelines, right? Mm -hmm. It's not coming from a health funder Exactly, right? It's, it's coming from someone who can appreciate in a way like this takes so many different things. I, I, I don't want to get too far into it, but just at COCAP, somebody was talking about the indicators of a thriving community, and so many of us understand that, right? There's a lot of work on that in the last decade around like um, do you have, you know, what are your health indicators, what are your housing indicators, like all of these things, like maybe seven or nine of them. <clears throat> And I actually find that I used to really appreciate that because sometimes you could then weave arts and culture into that. But I'm actually finding that indicator model to be super problematic because it once again reifies funders' ways of saying like, well, we'll work on just that lever to depress without actually being like, this is a people endeavor, right? It's a community endeavor. So I just want to point that out. Um, I just mm -hmm. want to say I was glad you um, came back around to ecosystem as opposed to infrastructure, mm. right? Um, because it's the systems approach that really makes a difference. So even if you're talking about funders and benchmarks, the question is, what are the outcomes that the process will create? 
right? Yeah. It, it's, it's less about your mission alignment and more about your actual inputs into the space that you want to make an impact on, right? And mm -hmm. as you point out, you can't just talk about health inputs, right? You can talk about, um, for example, our third uh, mission pillar is heal people power. Mm -hmm. And it really, it, it, it not only takes into account the historical, social, um, and interpersonal healing that um, is necessary to support communities to move into a place of cooperation and durability, but um, it also refers to the internal um, social, psychological, and organizational illnesses that we produce, reproduce as practitioners ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there should be this whole constellation of questions that each organization asks about the organization they want to fund, whether or not they're ready to press all the levers. Mm -hmm. The question is, are you considering all the constellations of relationships in your impact area? What do right. you perceive those necessities to be? And how do you plan to draw them into your ultimate project goal? That's a, yeah. That and I'll credit um, Nia, who's in this room from um, Boston Ujima for pointing something out that I was sort of like, I'm still, you know, I feel like I have to translate even inside my own brain. There's the part of me that's like 20 years as a grant maker. And then there's the, the conversations that I have on the ground. And I have to kind of do this like little switcheroo because then I also have to translate it to our funders and the funding field, which is she said that a lot of the work in terms of how culture manifests is around healing work. Yes. Um, and I was like, well, I kind of get it on a theoretical level. But then it was like, oh, that shows up in how they structure their governance. That's um, with the community. It's, right. It's like a whole thing. So, um, Lauren, you've done years of work in economic justice, et cetera. And the reason I wanted, and I'm appreciative of you um, being with us, is that you've also helped hone my own language and thinking around the concept of cultural finance. And you also shared um, something very powerful, which is we don't talk about it this way because we're so siloed, but that economic systems are by nature cultural, right? And I was wondering if you could share a little bit about your frame, like how did you get to your point of view about cultural finance? Because I think that would be really helpful for those of us on this journey. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and, and to be with these giant uh, leaders in the field. I uh, have a lot of respect for the work they've been doing um, and monitoring it for a while. And for me, the reason why this is really deeply cultural work is because um, what cultural finance to me means is a set of agreements among a group of people about how they access capital how they use that capital, and how they regenerate that capital in their community for community benefits. And there are lots of examples of this. We, in this room, are probably familiar with ones that we've heard on this panel, but ones in our own communities. Whether you're from a community that uses something that's called a rotating savings and credit association, or commonly referred to as a SUSU in some communities. Uh, I see people nodding heads. That's a very common reference point in lots of communities. SUSUs, or rotating savings and credit associations exist in all kinds of communities, particularly among indigenous people and people of color. Uh, people who come to the United States from other places bring their savings and credit norms with them, and they have a set of agreements about those norms. It isn't only that they have a culture about how they access um, the cultural norms in their community around performance and the arts. It's also about how they access and utilize currency and how they use that currency to build power, to build economic power. Now, why was that necessary? It was necessary for the same reasons that Noni talked about. Because the chain, I would say the chain was never intended to be working in those communities. I would say the chain was always intended to be broken. Mm -hmm. And it has been a perpetual systemic approach to breaking the chain in communities that have come to the United States, that were brought to the United States, that were indigenous to the United States, uh, and make sure that they don't have a stronghold of economic power. And so that, that has necessitated people devising their own ways when their communities have been redlined and shut out and disenfranchised and, with, and capital withdrawn from those communities in an intentional, systematic way, it's been necessary for those communities to come to the U.S. or arrive in the U.S. and devise their own way of managing currency, of managing resources around their own cult cultural norms, around their own set of agreements, right? And that set of agreements has, has led folks to really thinking about how they infuse culture, how they infuse ritual, how they infuse normative behaviors, uh, how they deal with disagreement and dissonance uh, and discord around money? Uh, how do you ensure that they have scalable projects that they invest in? 
um, what are the norms and rules around when money is used and the purposes that the money is used for. So for me, cultural finance is really an encompassing notion about how people in a community, however they define themselves, um, agree to use currency uh, to improve their community and empower their community. There's a um, thing that you're reminding me of that I say often, but I have to say it's pr pretty quietly. I've never been taped saying this, but I also feel like when we talk about these kind of normative behaviors in the dominant system, and I mentioned um, you know, this particular moment we're in, a, in how to interpret capitalism as you know, the highest amount of profit for, uh, at the expense of planet and people, right? That it's not just relegated to the commercial sector. It's actually in the nonprofit sector that we have this particular you know, Western European hegemony that gets deployed. And I very overtly often say, over the years I've been working in this field of philanthropy, that um, nonprofit work is, an, is inculcating people into a particular behavior. Um, just the nature of like competition-based grants, um, being able to sort of um, you know, show up in a certain way that makes sense, like you know, people who get rewarded for being academically conferred. So much of foundation work today is also about, um, rather than really starting with the people, and what they need, or communities and what they need. It starts actually with like, well, let's, let's get empirical back data um, to actually justify why we would be funding in this area. And then have everyone who is seeking our funds conform to, to, these, um, uh, to the kind of um, goals made explicit in that program design work. And that is actually for the work that you guys are doing, and for so many who are trying to actually create financial independence from those systems, a lot of just even the most innocuous behaviors in foundation work are really um, undercutting and undermining um, on the ground efforts. So uh, you don't have to comment on that. Uh, that's just my own point of view, but oh, you will. That is cultural. Mm -hmm. that's exactly, right. That's right. cultural. That's right. Right. Yeah. That's right. So when we're talking about the role of culture and social transformation, we have to recognize that Western bureaucratic power practices are cultural frameworks that are built up with symbolic production, mm -hmm. human concern. These are not objective structures. These are not scales mm -hmm. that simply apply to reality. These are human beings creating these outcomes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe that's a good segue to, I want to actually start to get explicit, because frankly, we haven't yet gotten explicit and ambitious in our in own initiative about what we mean when we talk about systems change. Because you all and others, of course, in this room have helped us learn that systems change, again, I said it at the opening, we thought about systems change th purely through an economic lens. And it wasn't because we, were, we thought economy is more important than health. It wasn't that. It's just that we kept trying to go as upstream as possible around just one problem. But it's a big problem, which is, for so long, we've been trying to help artists be financially sustainable in the pursuit of their practice in America. And current systems of support just don't cut it. So we just kept going upstream. And finally, it, came all, it went all the way up to like economic systems. But in conversations with all of you, we've been becoming more aware that it's actually about black empowerment that it's not just about like a theoretical. This is why we've shifted from like, well, let's you know, go an academic route. And I'm wondering how you interpret cultural work and what it means for you in terms of like, if you saw it forward, you know, for over the next 10, 15 years, ideally, like, what would that economic system look like and who, who would be the leaders of that system? Oh, I know you know. No, maybe no, I just couch. No. Maybe I just couched it in a confusing way. But you know, I, I, what, what you? I, I don't know that I'll land on the exact um, question, but but something that's been said that's sort of been percolating right now is um, you know, one of the things that we thought about with the runway project and you know purchasing certificates of deposit because there are lots of other ways this could have happened, but we thought about the cultural sort of relationship between um, institutions and things that are already there, what you already know about, how you speak to each other, um, and what the perceptions of risk look like for everybody differently. 
And we were trying to find a way where we could all show up and be investors, where we could take out some of those um, layers of privilege and access that have been rewarded inside of this financial institution because of proximity to whiteness. We wanted to remove a lot of those things and say, okay, my dad can do this and you big institution or foundation can do this and we can actually be together because some of those layers of power dynamics that we keep perpetuating are inside of who gets to be named this thing and who's not. And then what does that do for the power building of that community, the base build, the, the building, political building and power building in that community when automatically you're saying I'm not invested place. I shouldn't, I shouldn't own, have an ownership stake. I shouldn't talk about this as my thing. And so how do I really get engaged on the ballot at that point? How, do I, how am I then engaged across these other layers of things? How am I engaged as my own health advocate? If, I, if you're already telling me that there, there should not be any place for me to so show up the way that you get to show up. Mm -hmm. And so it was really a very intentional thing for us to think about how we keep pressing that lever of who gets named what and what does that look like. Um, so, let me stop right there. because you got that. There, was a, there was a soapbox and I was about to just get one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then I had to, I was about to black out and realize there are other people here that I need to make space for. You know how you get on. It's like, well, right. It's up and that was me, right? So let me take a breath and just sort of let that land for a moment. We'll marinate on that. Right, we'll right, 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 right. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Ashe, yes. Lauren, you've, you've done so much work over the years um, where, I don't know, I mean, share with us, like, do people who are working, especially out, out of the foundation sector, really overtly and intentionally think about that cultural finance term? I don't know that it's a term of currency in the sector. I, I don't hear uh, the colleagues that I'm aware of who do economic justice funding, for example, using that as a frame necessarily. Um, and I don't know that you need to. It, it works for me because it helps me to just, get, it gives me some language and a framework for understanding what I see happening really all over the world and all over the United States, which is whether you're talking about Grameen Bank and the work that Muhammad Yunus has done, or Aaron Tanaka and the work that they're doing in the Ojima Project, or work that you know, Runway and Jessica is doing. Yeah, it's just as Mia, Mia, Nia's over there uh, behind the pole. You know, all these, there's some common threads here. Um, you know, what Muhammad Yunus started to do there was really recognize that there was a consistency of norms and expectations that he was already could build on. Like, there, there were just norms and a set of relationships and social capital, Western term, but it's this notion of social capital already existed. And it provided a basis for thinking about how you could move capital in a community to support microfinance, right? Uh, Mondragon, uh, you know, colleagues and I were visiting Mondragon and did a study tour earlier this year. Uh, same basic notion, an international, very complex enterprise, over 100 actually businesses within this enterprise, but, around, but centered around a set of common norms and expectations and agreements that really what they're all working for is Basque country. That every enterprise, every country, every company is, is, is created with one single mission in mind, benefit Basque people. Now there's a lot of, there's a lot of different businesses and a lot of different industries that Mondragon operates, but they all operate for a common purpose, Basque, right? And so there's a set of expectations and agreements around that. And similarly in the U.S. context, what I see in communities of color in particular all over the U.S., it's people organizing around a notion of what we can do to benefit ourselves because nobody's coming to save us. We have to save ourselves. We have to figure out how we're going to empower and build the kind of economic um, um, uh, pathways for uh, meeting the needs in our communities and not expecting people to come and do it for us. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the historic record shows that no one's coming to do it for you. In fact, if they come, they may come to destroy what you built. All right? And so the, the notion really is, in philanthropy, is how can we use all the tools of foundations, all the resources, and I mean all, the 5% that we grant and the 95% that is invested uh, to really make a difference in elevating the work that Jessica and Noni and others like them are doing in the U.S. and around the world. Thoughts? Yes. <laughs> Slightly challenging thoughts, so, right. Um, I think that there is a, a silence around the fact that Black Americans, Black American American communities, at least me being raised on the West Coast, it's not the South, 
cannot be said to have a very specific to their needs, frameworks, and history, cultural approach to using, circulating, and recapitalizing, if you will, money. That is part of the structure of disorganization that causes black American communities to be so vulnerable and to every movement of the market, to every cycle through communities, to every need, because the cultural approach that we are told to use and caused to use, first of all, is a Western capitalist approach. And that approach structurally excludes our usage, right? So if we're talking about cultural usage of money, we have to not just say like, oh, well look at those black folks down there in the lower bottoms. They could use the susu because they are descended from the African folks from some very specific region among um, um, scores of countries, right? What we have to think about in relationship to culture and the use of money is rebuilding, reaffirming, and even recreating something that is very specific and functional for the people that we're engaging with, right? You point out from the very beginning, friends and family, I cannot call my, my cousins and ask for $1,000. I actually have to give that to them because they need that from me. Um, and in terms of financial organization, um, even, <laughs> oh my God, um, the panel Annie McShears was on where um, her panel mate uh, mentions, do not give a black bank $100. Their cost of transaction costs so much more than that $100. That's the way to destroy a black bank quickly. There are very specific um, exigencies of black dispossession in the US that have to be looked at, taken apart and understood in order to speak of anything like a cultural, um, a cultural um, 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 convention around money, finance and capitalizing, mm -hmm. right? And that's what we're trying to recognize in, in, through using cooperative principles, right? Because I definitely um, believe in the Mondragon model, but there's a homogeneity, there's a national, there's a coherent national identity, there is a land base, there is a, a, a notable, at least now, in the beginning, they were so poor that this is probably not the case, but there is a notable absence of systemic interference with their ability to create financial unity. And those, those conditions are all hold in the opposite in black American communities, right? We're coming off of the 90s of predatory lending. That was racialized, right? When you go and look at actuary tables for risk factors, out of the box, not being a white skinned person downrates you by certain points. That is racialized and systemic. So in order to make any of these claims that we're making for our work, there has to be a courage to talk about the fact that I cannot walk my brown behind into just any old bank, whether I am degreed, whether I am named the executive director, whether I am on the page, front page of the New York Times and receive a loan with the same kinds of asset base under me as my white counterpart. You cannot disappear that. Yeah. There's also something about, so in this conversation, where, where we show up is, um, I think about the legacy of just arts and culture philanthropy over the past two plus generations. And to this work of um, changing not only economic systems, but um, building back up communities who have been so extracted from, arts and culture uh, done a lot of damage. And here's why I'm going to share the frame for, for how we come into this conversation. Is that we're, you know, it's very easy to say that um, largely arts and culture in America through institutional support is very much about um, West, Western European hegemony um, and inculcating others to that. And it, and it happens in very specific ways. It's you know, artists in America have to be um, degree conferred that they are, um, uh, that they look a certain way, 
practice a certain way, etc. <clears throat> oh, I'm, I wish my water was up here. I'm sorry, but that the um, but what I'm also seeing is that right now we have this moment where there's a lot of efforts within philanthropy for, and I really hate that it's become an acronym: DEI support, D diversity, equity, inclusion. And I'm always like, equity work that looks so different than those other two, right? But the reason I say all this is just to say that I'm still right now dismayed that when people talk about, oh, we're doing inclusive economy work, oh, thank you, we're doing inclusive economy work, or we're doing um, just transition work, et cetera, it's devoid still about acknowledging a lot of the damage that even our own industries have done to per participate in actually taking away power from certain communities. And even in the grant making, even if it's to really good, whether it's activists or movement organizations, the way they structure the funding to me is highly problematic, right? Asking for your time to do a specific project or whatnot, rather than investing it in a way where it's just like you guys actually, it, in some ways it's redistribution I'm asking for, right? Like I'm where that wealth of um, different kinds of assets, um, network assets, intellectual assets, et cetera. All of that is, um, you know, it's not dictated by the funder, right? And so just my long-winded way of just acknowledging that we don't clearly have the right answers, but that we all actually need to be thinking about how we can actually support work of, you know, that you guys are leading and others, or we actually have to start to step back, like very deliberately. You know, I challenge whether or not we don't have the right answers. You know? I feel like I don't. Yeah. <laughs> in the sense of, I'll give you an example, um, in that this connection between um, the sort of, um, um, my work, my background is in um, non-governmental organizations internationally and then the, the U.S. nonprofit um, industrial complex, if you will. Um, and there's a there's a there's a continual generational like every generation through these fields there's some sexy term right so if we go to international development we were talking about structural adjustment and then we were talking about austerity right and so right now we're talking about diversity equity and inclusion and if you look at for example the intentions of the city of Oakland to add 5,000 um, housing units to downtown Oakland under the banner of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. And these household units are going to reach 80% um, of AMI, right? 80% mm -hmm. of AMI, AMI is about eighty to $85,000. The average white Oaklander makes $85,000. The average black Oaklander makes $36,000. So then under the banner of diversity, equity, and AMI, you are using funding to build 5,000 new units that if you look at the naked, clear-cut numbers, are specific set-asides for white Oaklanders, specifically excludes black Oaklanders. There is no question or confusion around whether that is the right approach or not. But you can go, my, my cooperator can pull the document out that shows those two things on the same piece of paper as a diversity and equity inclusion goal. So we may not know all of the nuts and bolts we're all experimenting in r and Ding, but there's some stuff that's really clear and really naked that could demonstrate the right pathway into supporting folks. And what I'm hearing you say is, at least from a funder perspective, we need to be asking better questions. If we really are trying of ourselves, of ourselves like if we're really trying and genuinely interested in whether it's DEI or whatever, social justice, et cetera, if we're not asking those questions and seeing it clearly, we're intentionally at this stage of, you know, of all of civil society, we're, yeah. you know, and we're you intentionally obfuscating. Yeah. And you certainly don't want to ask the question of a $200,000 capitalized consultant who has never walked mm -hmm. through a pile of trash and seen a human that they were in high school with. Right. 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 Those are the wrong people to ask those questions of. Just say that at this point, if we could just um, go into group discussion, so we'll just sh turn off the live stream.